Hello, everyone, and welcome to Enter the Abyss. So tonight is going to be a little bit different. Um, Britain's not here. Um, he had some type of freak basketball incident, and um, he couldn't make it, which is quite unfortunate. Our original topic tonight was going to be um, some possessed nun from the Middle Ages who wrote a manuscript that was recently decoded through AI, but we'll have to push that back to next week. So what are we drinking tonight? I'm doing this solo here. Um, we're doing Seagram's uh, whiskey mixed with uh, a white monster. So we'll see how that turns out. I'm going to pour it real fast. What could go wrong with a downer and an upper? I've always been a little bit into the cheap whiskeys. I've always found that I don't think the quality goes that much up when you spend more on whiskey. I don't mind it. Usually I don't mix it, but, you know, I just felt right to do it for this episode. Just be forewarned, this episode probably will not have, have as many jokes, just because there's no one to really vibe off of, so if this isn't your episode, don't listen to it. We just got about 100 subs in the last 30 days, and I don't feel right not posting an episode on Sunday night, so thank you for everyone who has subbed or well past 500. I'm going to throw out a quick update here. Um... We are just waiting on some PayPal funds to become available for us to go on the trip to the Clown Motel. Should be available within two weeks. We'll get the camera sent to us, and then me and Britain will put figure out the logistics on how we're going to do everything. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I know a lot of you guys are probably wondering what we look like and everything along those lines. It's going to be a, a spicy episode. So thanks, everyone. I think we're at well past the 500s at this point. So anyways, let's jump into tonight's topic, which is... A story titled, How My Friend and I Were Stalked for Years and Nearly Kidnapped. Oh, that drink is weird. Hmm. Oof, I don't know how I feel about that. It's okay. First part of the story got deleted, so I'm going to shorten it. Basically, at summer camp, me and my friend started to attend in 2019, does surveys every year based on the topic we'll be discussing, so we get better public speaking and more generalized opinions from others in the area. Me and my friend teamed up with two counselors and hit the town. Our last stop was a Walmart, and we talked to a bunch of different people. The most memorable was the second to last, an older man that asked for our names, and all about us, after he finished answering our questions. At the time, we were both 13, with hardly any concept of stranger danger, so we gladly answered about ourselves. Anyways, a few days later, an account popped up on our friend's request called Ed Pat. The account liked a bunch of old posts, commented a bunch on fire and rose emojis, and called us hot and sexy on our posts. It got to the point where they started to send dick pics. Oh boy. Oh boy. So me and my friend ended up blocking the account. Only, a few days later, the account was permanently deleted. It didn't show up in our searches for it. That's why we thought it was the end of it. It was not. When we finally got back to school in August, we basically forgot the event altogether. Yet again, this time, on both of our Facebook accounts, we get a notice from someone named Ed Pat wanting to be our friend. Immediately blocked the account again, but not before they had already commented lewd things on my baby pictures, commented on how pretty my baby blonde hair was, how I look good in short dresses, etc. After that, we both talked to our parents about the situation and other than keeping our accounts private, there wasn't much else we really could do. The cops shrugged it off and said just to take the app down completely. But hey, we're teens. Of course we didn't do that. Over the years, till around the end of 2021, this man kept sending friend requests from different accounts with similar variations of their names. Which was a bit stupid, but whatever. Though, at the beginning of 2022, this is where it starts to get really creepy. Accounts with names and pictures of our friends started showing up in our notifications, so obviously, we added them thinking it was our friends. We were wrong. Almost immediately, most of our posts had likes or comments on them from this account, and there were multiple DMs of dick pics to both of us. We blocked the account again. This became a reoccurring cycle. An account with friends, info, pictures, and mutual friends would get hacked, stolen, duplicated, etc. just so they could friend us again and again, without worrying too much about it. Finally, it got to the point we stopped adding people from our school at all, even friends. The final time this happened was in the summer of 2022. The swarm of fake accounts had stopped roughly two months prior, and seeing as this friend request looked legit, 
by a, a school friend, I decided to try it out. My friend didn't. She was still wary, but I decided to give it a shot. The compromise was to fully delete our socials and get new ones if this account turned out the same. I was definitely a stupid 17-year-old, but try not to judge me too harshly. But this account didn't spam our pictures, didn't DM us dick pics, just interacted with us like any normal school kid would. A like here and there, a new post, a like on a story posted, never commented on posts. So, finally, we thought it was over. Ha <laughs> ha, wrong. Strange things started to happen and became more of an intentional thing than a coincidence. I would post a picture of me and a friend at the park. A couple minutes later, a white truck pulled up into the lot, eerily close to my car. Driver's side door, but we tried not to think too much of it. There were still a few spaces over. Me and my friends were in the swings, basically a straight line of sight from the parking lot. The truck lights remained on, pointed at us for a long time. It got to the point that me and my friend finally started getting worried and anxious, so we hopped up from the swings and decided to take laps around the park instead. The car was far, too close to mine for us to be comfortable chancing getting into it at the time. Mind you, it was 10 p.m. at night, so we were the only ones there. We waited and roamed the park for nearly an hour before the truck finally drove away. That's when we raced to my car and I drove home, looking behind me frequently just in case. This happened in early June, and it kept happening. I didn't really notice it, thought it off as a one-off occurrence. It never dawned in my head that it happened after I posted pictures or said where I was with friends. But I started to see a white truck just about anywhere I posted about, even one that would wait outside my high school when I posted a story about my walk to my mom's store only a mile from our school. Again, young and dumb. I didn't think the worst of it. I thought it was a parent waiting for a kid. Plus, there is a bunch of people that owns all kinds of variations of white trucks in my town. So, I never put too much worrying into seeing them all the time. My friend never mentioned any white trucks, and if we were together, we rarely saw any of them. But I started to get nervous of them after one time I was walking to my mom's store, I decided to take a glance at the driver of the truck that sat near the car line every day after school. It was the same, if not a bit older, man from our Walmart survey trip of 2019. It was bizarre, definitely. We were never expecting to see him again, especially since we met him in a few towns over from our own. Yet lo and behold, he was right there. That's when I walked, probably ran actually, to my mom's store. This kept happening, and I finally knew I was being stalked after seeing him that first time because I saw him everywhere on foot. Anyway... Anyways, this post is getting long, so I'll fast forward to the last bit that just happened on the last day of our shared summer camp in late July 2023. At this point, I was still 17, and since I was older than most of the new campers, I might as well had been considered a staff member. I drove kids to camp and home every night, and they paid me for the gas money, so I was cool doing it. it didn't bother me, since they were in the same small town as me, and there were others further away that counselors typically drove home. This day, I posted all the last day campfire pictures right before I left so I could try to save my phone that was suffering from glitches, lack of data, and didn't let me communicate slash call others because my storage was too full. So I photo dumped a bunch of stuff, but it didn't fix the problem. My phone was essentially broken in all but name. It hardly worked, and I bought my current phone after this occurrence. On top of this, one of the older campers that I visited on the last day, 19M, didn't have a phone either, but he was also in the car with me. In the back seat, I had three campers. One didn't have a phone either, and the other two were dead. One was charging, theirs in the carport, but we didn't think much of it. Just turned on the radio full blast and gunned it back home. As I pulled off the back road of our camp up to the intersection, the light turned green and we went forwards. In the lane next to us was a white truck that kept turning his brights on and off. It was a bit weird, so I sped up, but I didn't think much of it. Side note, my best friend, let's call her Anne for this, has a baby. Anne had her kid at 16, so at this point, her kid was nearly a year old. Still very fussy in car rides and such. This becomes important later because Anne was there for the last day of camp too. She left right before we did when her baby became cranky. Eventually, I don't see the white truck behind me anymore, and I slow a bit down. It was nearly 9.30 at this point, 
late enough for the highway between our towns to be essentially empty. I have this back road that is a bit curvy that leads close to my house and directly to a rich neighborhood. It's the streets I typically take back to my house from camp if I had no one to take home, and everyone that was a regular in my car called it the detour. It was quite pretty with a bunch of full evergreen trees and wildlife. The kids, not really kids, but they acted like it, 13F, 15M, 15M, in the back were begging me to go on the detour since it was the last day of camp, so I caved in, hit on my blinker, turning right onto the back road. Now, listen, I'm not the safest person out there. Don't judge me. I'm still basically a kid too, but all the ones in the back love to hang out the windows on the back road, so I let them stick their heads out of the sunroof, sit on the windowsill, while holding the bars on top of my car. I went slow under 10 miles per hour just so they could do it and not worry about them getting hurt. I mean, there was no one on the back roads, cops never camped out on these streets, and I was going under the speed limit by like 20. So there really wasn't any harm in letting them stick out of the windows. Eventually, I let them bully me into taking them around the rich neighborhoods that had cool water fountains and covered bridges on their streets. Apparently, one of the covered bridges caved in so we had to go around this super narrow street right next to a large drainage ditch at least 15 to 20 feet deep. As we were going around it, a car comes up behind us. I assume it's one of the people who lived in the neighborhood, so I was going to speed up and let them get to their house. Finally, we come to a four-way of rich people street. Straightforward was a dead end, which is what I originally was going to do, to the left of the broken covered bridge and to the right was a back roundabout that would take us back to the beginning of the street. But it had no houses, lights back there because the neighborhood is still being built. But let's call him Jake19M, told me to go right. Mind you, one of the campers were sticking their body out of my skylight from the back seat, so I couldn't see out of my rear view mirror. I didn't really want to, but I trusted his instincts and I turned right. As soon as I did, I started to hear a honking behind me. I was a bit startled, and so were the kids in the back seat. I get a glance at my side view mirrors and I can't see anything past bright LED lights. I thought it was just because I took so long, so I sped up a bit after I turned right. There was a hook at the end of the hills on this back street and it makes you tug the steering wheel pretty hard to stay on the road, especially in the dark. The car behind me turned right too. They started flashing their LED brights, honking loudly, and had rolled down the window screaming at us. They kept trying to get in the lane next to us and bump into my car to run us off the road. That is when I knew this was serious. Instantly, I started screaming at the kids in the back seat to sit down, buckle up, and roll up their windows. They barely managed to do that by the time I hit the bend and the end of the hill really hard and gunned it off the street, driving around the drainage ditch with little problem. I've done it multiple times. There was no phone in the car to call anyone, least of all the police, so I just ended up speeding down the back streets as a car chasing me, trying to run me off the road multiple times. When we came upon the shop corners, they slowed down. That told me that they didn't know the area well, which I used as my advantage. As I was approaching a stop sign for me to go left or right, my house was the right, so left it was. I yelled to Jake to check my right because I'm not stopping for the sign. I sped past it. The car, this is about the time noticed it was a fucking white truck, tried to hit my bumper again. I swerved into someone's yard. Grass was damaged the next day when I drove past it. I booked it down the street, hitting every turn as fast as possible, and eventually I thought I lost the truck. I sped past my high school and onto the highway again, where we got off in the first place. I didn't see the truck behind us, and we were all still freaked out. I turned a right to go onto another main way. I passed by a closed gas station on the way, very important in a moment. I stopped at the gas station and handed the kids in the back some cash for them to go in and get drinks and snacks to help them calm down. None of them were crying, thank God, the adrenaline junkies they are. They thought it was the most exciting thing that's ever happened to them. I told Jake to go watch them in the store and make sure they didn't do anything stupid while I filled up my gas tank. We waited at the gas station for around 20 minutes before I went back onto the road to take them home just in case. I asked them if they had seen the car at all while they were hanging out of the windows, and only one of them said they thought they did, but the truck lights were off. It was the same truck from the town or so over from the intersection in front of the back road to our camp. 
They followed us for nearly 25 minutes. After I dropped them all off, I was still a bit shaky and decided to try and see if my phone would call someone that I could talk to about what happened. The only contact that would load was Anne, since she was the last person I talked to on her phone. With a stroke of luck, my phone actually let me call. She picked up, but all I could hear from her side on the line was her crying. Obviously panicking, I asked her what was wrong, and lo and behold, she shares a story eerily similar to what just happened to me. Apparently, Anne's baby started crying so loud that she could barely focus on the road, so she pulled into a closed gas station I mentioned earlier. Right outside our high school, I sped past. She was giving her kid their bottle when a white truck pulled into the lot. Immediately, she became wary because it was closed, and she was right. Less than 30 seconds later, this truck parked horizontally in front of Anne's car to block her in. She immediately started the car again, locked her doors, and pulled off over a grass curb, blocking her from the street. She was not chancing her baby at all. Anne told me that the only thing she remembered was that the man we had saw years ago in that Walmart, his eyes staring at her like she was a piece of meat for him to have. As she raced home, the truck caught up to her. She turned on the back roads, running out of gas, and the truck started flashing its lights, honk, run her off the road the entire time. But a couple streets before hers, a little red car pulled in front of her and started to brake check her as the white truck tried to hit her from behind. It was a mess. She took a chance, sped up, and swung onto the streets to at least lose the red car. The truck booked it after her. Apparently, both of her older brothers were waiting outside for her with some friends to help her bring back in stuff for her baby. Upon seeing this, she pulled into her driveway. The white truck sped off. If her brothers weren't outside, that would have been a different story. But anyways, long story short, the truck that follows me all the way back had an accomplice in a red car that followed my friend Anne. When they couldn't catch me, they went for her. Both me and Jake suspected that because I didn't go onto the dead end where the man could have cut me off. That's probably why it suddenly got violent so quickly. Edit. I never mentioned what happened after this, but the man in the white truck and the other in the little red car were found a town over when there was footage taken of them attempting to kidnap a seven-year-old off a porch and being attacked by their dog. Along with this, we found that there had been several sightings of a white truck around our town following others doing similar things days after it first happened to us following cars that had similar descriptions to my friends and I's cars. Our reports were officially filed after we saw the information of the car on Facebook, along with the identity of the man who had stalked us for years. It took years to get rid of them, but now we don't have to worry about these men anymore. Well, they sounded like creeps. Anyways, as we end for the night, we would like to shout out our paid subscribers. If you guys ever want to become one, you, you can click the link in the description. So thank you, Modelo Time, Cleat Meat, Claytor, Lord of Soup, Curtis and Laura, Laura Hendrickson, Mothman, Devin C., Conklin Family, and Lou Carroll. Your support helps us do fun things like this trip that we're doing to the Clown Motel. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, please like, share, and subscribe as it really helps us get us out there. If we get up to a thousand subs, we actually become a YouTube partner. As always, thank you for entering the abyss. Until next time.